The dialogue in Undertale is great. Better than great. It's chock full of A-grade humor, meta jokes about game tropes, and fascinating character moments. And there's a lot of it. Every room has several unique cell phone conversations that you can have with your friends. Every monster you encounter has their own little story that plays out in the middle of combat. At any point during the story, you can go all the way back to the beginning of the game and find old friends with new things to say. It helps that each boss is eminently likable, and the levels leading up to them are littered with cutscenes that do a great job establishing their personalities. For example, Toriel is just about the sweetest person on the planet, very earnest and affectionate, and importantly, fully aware of how awkward it will be for you to accept her as your new surrogate family. Despite that, she never stops trying, and you can tell she genuinely cares. You kind of want to try too, even though you know it won't work because there's so much more to be done in the game. Sans and Papyrus are quite possibly the funniest comedic duo in all of gaming. A skeletal Bert and Ernie who simultaneously make light of a number of different RPG conventions like eerily ubiquitous puzzles while also being very convincing as a pair of regular old bickering siblings. Every monster in Undertale has that kind of charm to them and they all feel distinct from one another. When you finally get to a boss encounter after having gotten to know the boss over the better part of an hour, it has a lot more impact than the fights in, well, pretty much any other RPG. Every moment in each area builds up to that final test, be it a test of your power or a test of your character. These fights really do carry the same weight as the final confrontation in Mother 3, especially in how you endure each enemy's attacks while trying to break through to them with unflinching compassion. But Undertale distinguishes itself from Mother in that it makes every character redeemable. There's no dramatic need for any storyline to end in tragedy. Once the fight is over, you can make up and become friends. The game even lets you hang out with the characters after the fact, and these dating segments make for some of Undertale's funniest and most memorable scenes. Even after the last boss, the game presents an opportunity to go back and talk to everyone you met along the way. It's these scenes, along with the dozens of little interactions leading up to them, that allowed the pacifist ending's final encounter to reduce me to a gibbering puddle of tears. The writing quality is obviously the most important factor in making that happen, but to praise it alone would be to sell Undertale's presentation short. Despite being low res, the game's graphics are expertly made, with great animation animations that convey character emotions and can even get a laugh in just a few frames. Undertale doesn't ask you to imagine the world its systems and simple graphics represent. The world as you see it is meant to be real. Characters speak in dialogue boxes, which they'll occasionally edit themselves, and react to on-screen graphics because that's just the way their world is. They really live in an 8-bit-ish RPG. It's surprising just how much more effective this is at getting you to identify with the characters than games with more realistic high-res graphics. The other big factor is, of course, the music. Before he was a game designer, Undertale's creator Toby Fox was known for his Earthbound remixes and his original compositions for MS Paint Adventures. He is a supremely talented musician, and Undertale puts all of his abilities to the test. There are many games with impressively catchy or atmospheric tracks, and between Spear of Justice and The True Lab, Undertale has its share of both, but few do such genuinely inspired things with composition and execution. For example, Home, the track that plays in Toriel's house, has a very cozy feel to it, but the fumbling, mistimed notes reflect both the awkwardness of the situation situation and how hard she's trying to make it work anyway. More broadly, consider the gap between the field and battle music. As you'd expect, every encounter makes heavy use of chiptunes, but when you're wandering around the world, you'll mostly hear real instruments like piano, violin, and guitar. This heightens the idea that the game world is a real place of sorts, and emphasizes the front that the characters who fight you are putting up. They don't really want to fight you, they're pretending to be something they're not, and as such their battle music sounds deliberately artificial. You can see the difference in the fights where they genuinely want to kill you. Undyne and Sand's battle tracks in the Genocide Run, for example, blend real instruments and chiptunes.
This style of mixing is also used to chilling effect when the lines between the game and reality start to blur. All of Undertale's final encounters do some cool, fourth wall breaking things. At the end of the neutral route, which you need to finish before you can go for the true ending, Asgore starts his fight with you by shattering the mercy button, a dramatic statement that tells you shit, in no uncertain terms, has gotten real. In a wonderful display of mechanics as metaphor, every boss's attack patterns tell you something about their character as they relate to you. Toriel avoids bringing your health all the way down, for example, while Papyrus is mostly just showing off. Undyne demands you stand your ground, while Metaton is more concerned with putting on a show than actually fighting you. But Asgore's pattern is probably the most telling. Through all of his attacks, his face is shrouded in shadow. He can't bring himself to look at you, and indeed, none of his attacks are really aimed at anything. He's clearly ashamed of what he feels he has to do, and it seems like he destroys the mercy button not to prevent you from fleeing, but because he doesn't think he deserves forgiveness. Whether you agree with him or not, his life is claimed by Flowey, who then uses the power of his soul, along with the six humans Asgore had killed, to break free of the constraints of his world and crash your game. When you re-enter, he's in full control of your save file, and you no longer get a turn. The game becomes pure bullet hell. The retro graphic style is also completely undone. Flowey stitches his new self together from real pictures to jarring effect. It leaves a similar impression to the unique art styles of the witches in Madoka Magica. In addition to royally fucking with you, the battle serves to finally establish Flowey's true character. Sadistic, unfeeling, and seemingly remorseless, he doesn't even understand love, so breaking through to him seems impossible, but when you beat him, you can spare him anyway, and he will remember it just like everything else that happens between save files. After the credits roll, he'll call you up to hint at what you need to do to get the true ending, and between that and the battle, you see a hint that maybe he could one day be saved, even without a soul. I mean, the call is designed to trick you into gathering all your friends' souls together for him, but there's still a bit of sentiment behind it. See, like every other boss monster, Flowey has a number of scenes that help you to understand him, it's just that they take place across multiple playthroughs. After finally befriending Alphys by witnessing the full reach of her mistakes, which are so bad that they drag the game into horror territory, and accepting her anyway, you're at last ready, emotionally and in terms of the game's script, for one last fourth wall shattering showdown with Flowey. And it is everything that the climactic encounter of a game this amazing should be. Flowey takes the soul of every other monster and returns to his true form, Azrael Dreamer, Toriel and Asgore's long dead son. The the depths of his loneliness start to become clear. This is a kid totally disconnected from his world, who reloaded every possible outcome of his every decision until the people started to seem like programs. Only you, as a player seeing the underground from the outside and through many different save files, can hope to understand that. Azrael declares that he will reset the world over and over to keep letting the same events play out, and he taunts that you'll play right into his hand. Leaf? out of your desire for a happy ending. But the game gives you every tool you need to prove him wrong. The strength of your determination is such that you don't even revert to old saves, you just straight up refuse to die. Using your hopes and dreams, literally, you can stave off his attacks until he gets serious and starts turning your friend's power against you. This, for me, is where the waterworks start. With their souls stolen, your friends revert to the closed off mentalities they had when you first fought with them, and it's up to you to break them out of their funk. You can no no longer access your save files, but you can save your friends by triggering their memories. Tell Sans a crappy joke to Papyrus's dismay, get Alphys rambling about her anime and encourage her to overcome her self-defeating attitude, hit Undyne with an affectionate fake punch, give Asgore a hug, slowly they all start to remember you. What gets me is that these moments, which I remember because they were so funny and enjoyable and weirdly human, are as important to the characters as they are to me. This funny little game, this game that remembers everything you do, cherishes your shared memories. And all of that resonates with Azrael. He starts to care again, after so many years of playing without feeling anything. Asriel cries, I cry a little, and then he says something that makes me cry a lot. Monsters are weird. Even though they barely know you, it feels like they all really love you. That rings true to me. I love a lot of games, but this is the only one that feels like it loves me back. In real life, obviously, the game doesn't really remember or feel anything, but the creative team behind it does. Toby Fox clearly has a lot of love for the games he's spoofing and emulating, and these characters that he's created. And from his care and attention to detail, it seems like he has a lot of love for his players, too. That probably sounds silly. I want to say more about Undertale, part of me never wants to stop talking about it. But anything else I say from this point forward, it's just going to be more rambling. This game is a brilliant achievement in design and writing. It's the first media thing 
I think, ever that has made me cry without killing off a main character, and it's definitely the first game I've played that has made me laugh and cry and feel genuine terror all within the space of an hour. This is a game that I want to replay over and over again, but out of respect for Undertale and respect for myself, I don't think I'm ever going to touch the save file again. This game really meant something to me. And I want to know what it meant to you, so please leave a comment telling me about your experience with the game and let's have a conversation about it, because this is a game that's worth talking about. I feel kind of tacky plugging my channel after all that, but if you enjoyed the video, I'd really appreciate it if you'd hit the like button and subscribe for more. You can follow me on Facebook and Twitter for regular updates about all my videos, too. Next episode, I'll be reviewing Xenoblade Chronicles, so look forward to that. If this is the first thing you've seen of mine, and you also didn't have the heart to tell Undyne that anime isn't real, you might enjoy my other series, What's in an OP, where I dissect the symbolism and cinematography in anime openings with the same obsessive attention to detail that you saw here. Today I'm highlighting Your Lie in April, because that also made me cry, and Welcome to the NHK, because it's got a similarly dark sense of humor to some parts of Undertale, and it's drenched in symbolism. As always, this is professional shitbag Jeff Thu crying down in my mother's basement.